Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this workers' retreat. We thank you because of extending the invitation to us. We know it is not by right, neither is it because we are worthy for it, but because of your own grace, because of your desire to bless us, because of your desire to refashion our lives and to reshape on our lives so that you can recommission us and give us a kind of ministry that is much, much greater than what we have ever known. We know it is this love, the death of love, that has moved you to arrange such a worker's retreat for us. And we pray, oh Lord, in gratitude, we will do everything we can to show that we appreciate your calling us together at this time in Jesus' name. Lord, may we see that this is your own provision. That this is not the provision of man or just the provision of the church. But this is the due time that you have judged fee to bring us together. And Lord, we pray that your own aim, your own desire... For bringing us together will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. 
may we look beyond man and look beyond all things that we ourselves personally can do and just look up to you alone so that you'll be able to do that which you intend to do in every one of our lives in jesus name whatever in us or around us or in other people towards us that will limit your blessing upon our lives that will hinder us from getting the best from you father we pray you will cancel them from our lives in jesus name sometimes lord it's just a little thought from within us sometimes it's just a kind of little feeling we have within us that can build a shelter around us build a wall around us that your spirit and your power and your blessing will not be able to penetrate but lord we're looking up to you that whatever it is within us whatever around us whatever in our own look in our own attitude in our own spirit in our own imagination our own desires and ambitions will hinder or limit your blessing in our lives cut it off in jesus name Oh Lord, we pray that every word coming from the pulpit here, every word coming from the seminar, every word coming from the Bible study, every word uttered in prayer, every word uttered in counseling, every word uttered in the discussing with one another will lead us, will move us to the depth of your blessing in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that as you met with Jacob at Peniel and you solved 20 years problem how we pray that you will meet with us here that in the morning in the afternoon in the evening in the night wrestling with the Almighty God praying and standing by the altar of the Lord that Lord the angel of blessing will not pass us by in Jesus name that O Lord as Moses went away from the children of Israel for some time and 40 days he spent in your presence and by the time he came back we are told that the facial appearance of Moses was shining how we pray that not only our face but our heart and our spirit and all within us will shine with the glory of God in Jesus name we find Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration that even though he was conceived of the Holy Ghost, even though at the end of 30 years when he appeared in Jordan, the heavens opened. Even though mighty signs and wonders have even manifested, even through him. But when he got to the Mount of Transfiguration, much and above what we ever saw before, much and above what he ever manifested before, the glory of God just shone through him. And now we pray that much more than we ever had much more than we ever experienced much more than we ever knew much more than we have ever received you will do for us at this time of the retreat in jesus name your word says when the sons of god came together then satan also came in their midst and as we come together sons and daughters of god it is possible because he doesn't want our good he doesn't want the best for us it is possible that lucifer the devil satan that is seeking for whom he may disturb and destroy and devour it is possible he may come around but oh lord we take authority over him in jesus name I cover every brother here, every sister here, every adult, every child here with the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I surround everyone with the fire of the Holy Ghost. That when demons come, they will not be able to penetrate. When Satan comes, they will not be able to penetrate. That when unworthy, unclean thoughts, imaginations come, they will not be able to penetrate in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that the heavens will open and our hearts will open and you will fill our hearts with resources from heaven in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that everything you have in store, everything you have in store, everything there is up there that you want to shower, you want to pour upon your people, 
We are praying that this weekend you will pour upon all your people in Jesus' name. Whatever is occupying the place of our heart, which is not going to allow your fullness to fill us. We pray, Lord, that you will take everything away. That you will purge us and empty us and put the insignificant and the pollutions away so that we can receive from heaven in Jesus' name. How we pray, O Lord, that you will not leave any stone unturned, that you will touch every part of our lives, that in this place there will be transformation, there will be transfiguration, that your people will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Father, we pray like that as you did with Samuel, and you did not allow a single word to fall to the ground. I will pray that in these days we spend together, none of your word will fall to the ground. But Lord, we pray that no heart will be like the sideway heart that receives and then the butts of air come to pick everything away. That no heart in this place, among those of us who are here and those who are still coming on the way, that none of us will be like the stony heart that will receive it with joy for a moment. But then eventually, because it has no root, everything will just be scorched with the sun. That no heart here, no life here, will be like that, that is the thorny ground. But Lord, I pray that the cares of life will not choke the word of God. That the things will let behind at home, or the things that the devil may want to bring to our remembrance, will not choke your word from us in Jesus' name. That every heart will be like the good soil, the good ground, that will receive the word of God and will bring forth fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. That Lord, the grace of God in us will multiply. The faith in God of God in us will increase. And our following after the Lord and running the race, we will run faster in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you will do more than we can think about. More than we can ask. Deep, deep things and great things from above. You will do for every soul present here. We know you will do it. We know we are going to rejoice at the end. We know that our churches and our zones and our areas and our house fellowships and the people of God who have left behind this blessing and this revival that is coming upon us here is going to affect them mightily in Jesus name from tonight send the fire down and let the life cool from the altar of God touch every leaf and touch every heart and touch every spirit in Jesus name at Lord right from this night right from this evening there will be a moving and a stirring and there will be a kind of change that we will know that good things have started that will never stop. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen 
the king, the lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send? And who shall who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Tonight, as we begin this workers' retreat, is the joy of my heart to welcome you. And I want to assure you that whoever you are, and whatever good and wonderful experiences you have had in the Lord, I believe that the Lord is going to multiply those good things in your life in Jesus' name. And it may be that the devil has been waging war with you, and has been trying to discourage you, and to send you back from the past that you have placed your feet by the grace of God. Never mind, the devil has always done that to the pilgrims on the way to heaven. And I believe that during this workers retreat, he will be brought to shame. Yes. And he will be defeated on your behalf in Jesus name. Yes. And as we begin, I want you to realize that no matter what you have gone through or what you are going through, you have come to the right place. Because we have, we have come to meet with the King of Kings himself and the Lord of Lords himself. And this beginning night is just a time to prepare ourselves so that everything the Lord has for us, he will pour upon us before we finish the workers' retreat in Jesus' name. I've read a passage to you, a passage that, that appears very simple looking at it on, on the surface. A passage that looks very familiar looking at it as we have read it. It is likely that those of us who are here because you are workers, it's likely you have read this before. It is likely that you have even marked some parts of this word in your own Bible because you have been following after the Lord and you have read this and you have said, I really identify with what is in there. But I believe that the Lord has something to tell us tonight. And as the Lord reveals all these things to us, I don't want you to miss anything at all. You realize that this is a special event. A special event because it is a workers retreat. And you will see on your program that this is a six workers retreat. Which means we have had five already. And this is now your turn. And for you and for me, it is a special event. And you need to take it as a special event. You will see that the passage I've read to you was a special event also. In the life of Isaiah, the prophet of God. And he took it special and the angels of God took it special and God took it special for him. You see, God will make of this retreat what you want him to make of the retreat. You take it as an ordinary event and then God says, well, he calls it ordinary so it will be ordinary for him. You call it a special event in your own life. And God says, well, he calls it special. Therefore, heaven and God and the angels will make it special in your life. It is a special event. Great things I expected. And you will see that this was the very beginning of the ministry of Isaiah. When I say beginning, if you look at all the chapters in Isaiah, you see that the chapters are more than 60. And yet, we're here in, chap in chapter 6. Only five chapters have gone. And when you look at your life, you might be thinking you have done the majority of things you need to do. But the Lord is here telling you that you have not even done a half of what you ought to do. And that this is only the beginning. And if you'll follow the Lord through the rest of the chapters of your life, great things are still expected in your life in Jesus' name. God was willing to bless Isaiah. And we need to realize that God is willing to bless us as well. Then on the part of Isaiah, there was a readiness to receive all that the Lord had for him. And on your part, you need a readiness and a willingness to receive everything the Lord has for you. If you look at the passage I've read, you might see four things. Number one, revelation. Number two, realization. 
Number three, revival and renewal. Number four, recommissioning. Because he had been commissioned before. He had been preaching the word of God from chapter one. He had been having the vision of the Lord and declaring the burden of the Lord unto the people of God from chapter 1. And yet there was a recommissioning here. God bringing the commission again saying, who shall I send and who, sh who will go for us? And then he responded and he said, here I am, send me. Let's go back to the first part which is revelation. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Here was the revelation that Isaiah had. And I want you to look at the circumstances surrounding the revelation that he had. What were the circumstances? King Uzziah had died. Who was King Uzziah? King Uzziah was one of the kings of Judah. And this king, one time, had gone to the temple of God and had offered incense, something he shouldn't have done. He was confronted by the priest, but then he rejected that confrontation and counsel and correction. Eventually, leprosy came upon him. He was taken out of the throne. Even though he was taken out of the throne, he was still the kind of pseudo-king. And it wants still manifesting authority in the land. But then it says King Uzziah died. The one manifesting pseudo authority upon his life had died. You see, sometimes revelations of God will not come to us until cell that is trying to occupy the throne. Until that self manifests pseudo authority upon our lives, until it is taken out of the way. Your own self will, my own self will, that is sitting on the throne, that is wanting to control, that is wanting to guide, that is wanting to dictate, that the Lord has rejected, and this self will is full of spiritual leprosy. Self, in the sight of God, is dirty, is corrupted. Is having this disease of spiritual leprosy and should not be controlling our lives as a people of God, as a children of God. And it is in the time that that self trying to control, trying to guide, and trying to have to usurp the authority of God and of Christ in our lives, when it is taken out of the way, you begin to see revelations. Revelations of God. Revelations of His will. Revelations of the, of the field that is before us. Revelations of the glory of God. And therefore, during this workers retreat, you need to check up and I need to check up. If there is this self that is still occupying the throne, or the self-will that is still occupying the throne, or the mind of man that is still occupying the throne, or my own ambition, my own desire that is still occupying the throne. And you want King Uzziah that has got this leprosy as judgment from God. You want that king to die so that the real king and the true king will reign upon the throne of your heart. Only then will he begin to reveal the glory of heaven to your own soul. He said, then I saw. He must have opened the spiritual eyes to see. In fact, you know, Isaiah himself tells us that there were people, and it's applied to the New Testament Pharisees, they have closed their eyes so that they will not see. And they say, no, I don't want to see that. They didn't want to see that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that is the appointed one, the anointed one, the Messiah, they closed their eyes so that they will not see. They made themselves blind, so they were blind. But then Isaiah said, voluntarily, I opened my spiritual eyes. And then I saw, I saw also the Lord. He concentrated his attention on the Lord. His desires on the Lord. His ambition on the Lord. His aspiration on the Lord. I saw also the Lord. And during this a time we come together, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for you to see the Lord? To see the Lord in his grace. The grace to restore. And the grace to save. To see the Lord in his glory as he comes to purge his people and make them part of the glorious church. 
and to see the Lord in his majesty and his power as he manifests his power and he pours out his power upon his people. Wouldn't it be wonderful for you to open your spiritual eyes? You know, sometimes your physical eyes may be dim and your spiritual eyes too may be dim. Because, you see, if you are sleeping while the word of God is being preached, if you are dozing off and your eyes are dim and you can't not even open your Bible, your hands are weak, your mind is weak, your eyes are dim, and you cannot concentrate when the word of God is being preached, how are you going to hear the Lord? How are you going to see his vision? Are you going to be able to see the Lord filling the temple? It says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Do you make any connection there? Uzziah that sat upon the throne had died. And now Isaiah opened his eyes and what did he see? He saw that even though Uzziah had died, even though the pseudo king that tried to manifest authority, a phony kind of thing, fake kind of king, a disobedient kind of king that tried to usurp the authority, he had now died. Then Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, this time high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Above it stood the seraphims. These were the servants of God. These were the messengers of God. These seraphims were a kind of angels. And these angels stood in attention. And then it says, One had each had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. These angels, having six wings, with two of the wings, and if you've seen some pictures of angels before, you see those wings are quite large. And with two of those wings, he covered his face. You see, the children of Israel always had honor, always had this honor and respect and reverence for God. You will see that when the Lord appeared, or when they had the voice of God in the Old Testament, they will fall down, lest they see God, lest they see Him. There was this reverence, so that they will not become so familiar, because it says familiarity brings contempt. But they had this honor and this respect, and these angels demonstrated that with twain, they covered their faces. And then it says, with twain, He covered His feet. What humility, what sobriety before the Lord, the absence of frivolity, that now we are in the presence of God and our comportment should show that we are in the presence of God. And here we are, that we have come to this workers' retreat. How do we move around on the compound? How do we discuss with one another? What kind of words do we speak? How do we relate together? How do we put ourselves in such a spiritual condition that will be demonstrated by what these angels have done? That as we come to the presence of God, the reverence, the honor, and the glory we ascribe to God, the humility and the meekness, and the sobriety and the controlled language and the controlled movement that we have in the sight of God will show whether we respect and we honor and we lift high the glory of God or not. And then it says, Well, twain he did fly. Fly to where? Fly to wherever the Lord has appointed. Because those, those angels never go anywhere except where God directs them to go covering the face so as not to become so familiar with God and run into contempt then covering his feet so as to guide and to control and to restrain even the movement and then with two and he did fly so that they can do speedily and go speedily where the Lord wanted them to go and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the Lord of hosts. The use of the mouth and the use of our speech, very important if you really want to retain the revelation of God. There are many people that have lost great revelations 
and they have missed great revelations because of the use the wrong use of their mouth but these angels cried one to another holy 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 is the lord of hosts and then it says the whole earth is full of his glory the whole earth is full of his glory but I dare tell you there are many people in Judah that didn't even see the glory of God at all. And as I said, I see this glory of God and it fills the whole earth. But there are people in Judah that didn't see any part of that glory at all. Why? Because their eyes are not opened. And this is part of the whole earth. And I believe that during these days, the glory of God will fill this place. But then for you to see that glory of God filling this place, you have to be in a proper condition. In a proper condition. Well, before I go to the realization, let me just say something here. Because I'm talking on being in the proper condition. And you really want to see the glory of God filling all this environment. And in the hostels, the glory of God filling the place. Now, you know the hostel may look like an ordinary building. But it depends on what we make of it. If what we do over there is what is annoying to God, displeasing to God, obviously the glory of God may be available, but we'll not see that glory. But then if even during we're in the hostel or we're in the bathroom and we realize that this is holy ground, we realize that this is a place where to see the glory of God and therefore we measure our word. We we'll say, what kind of word do you speak in God's sanctuary? What kind of temper do you manifest in God's sanctuary? What kind of conversation do you have in God's sanctuary? And you see every place in this place, you see it as a sanctuary of God that is, uh, that is to be filled with the glory of God. And then you walk softly and you walk gently and you walk prayerfully and all the time waiting, expecting to see the glory of God. You are saying, I don't know. It may be while I'm just sleeping in day so still, the glory of God will manifest itself. It might be while we're going to carry the food in the kitchen that the Lord will just meet me on the way like this and will reveal his glory unto me. And therefore, wherever I am, whatever I am doing, whoever I'm discussing with, I want to keep that perspective knowing that the glory of God may descend upon me at any time. It may be that you go to the supermarket and just as you are there in the supermarket, you are saying, well, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. And this place is supposed to be full with the glory of God. Therefore, you say, oh Lord, although I'm in the supermarket for a purpose, although I'm outside there to buy a cassette or to buy Christian literature for a purpose, although I'm over there in the kitchen, I'm cooking, preparing something for a purpose, although I'm at the hostel now and it's for a purpose, although we are the choir stand and we're practicing and it's for a purpose, but oh Lord, this may be my time for the glory of God to come upon me. And therefore that moderates and restrains your comportment. And therefore, you don't, you don't do anything that will make God to say, it's not watching for the glory of God. I believe you will see the glory of God. If the whole earth is full of the glory of God, your whole heart can be full of the glory of God. You know, it will be wonderful if you could be so filled with the glory of God. That when you are so filled with the glory of God, the people that, you know, talk to you like this and you open your mouth, you just discover that there's only one thing coming out, the glory of God. Because it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth will speak. It is what is in there that will be poured out when you open your mouth. How I pray that the glory of God will be upon every sister, will be upon every brother. And that as we touch one another, the spark of the glory of God will just come on immediately when the glory of God from this side meets the glory of God from this side. I pray that in all this camp where we are, that all in the night, in the morning, everywhere, all the days we're going to spend here, you will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Isaiah said, I saw. I saw. And you can see. And you will see. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verse 14. For the Lord thy God. Walketh in the midst of thy camp. To deliver thee. And to keep thee. To, to give up thine enemies before thee. 
Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that you see no unclean sin in thee, and turn away from thee. You know, generally it's in a camp like this. When we gather together, that the fire of God begins to burn. Now you realize that if you have a piece of wood that has live coal, that has fire in it, and you bring two together, and you bring five together, and you bring ten together, and you bring a hundred together, or you bring a thousand together, or you bring ten thousand together, and every one of those pieces of wood has real flame and real fire, and you bring everything together, you know what happens? You have a bonfire. That means you have all this wood together and the fire is burning. And they're going to see the flames, not only here, in the, in the next village, they're going to see that something is burning here. Because all the woods are brought together and the fire has been kindled on every one of them. And do you know that as we're here, there is enough power, enough glory of God represented in each one. And as we bring everything together, all the enemies can be totally scattered. You know, I want you to imagine if there are, if there are just some, uh, you know, insects and some snakes and some rabbits and some wild animals in a particular uh, forest. And then all these uh, places, all those venomous snakes, they have been hiding. And then you put a lot of wood, you put it there. And then you put some oil on all the wood. And then you kindle fire. You don't need to uh, light 1,000 uh, pieces of match or matches. All you need is just bring the wood together and then pour the oil on the wood and light just a single stick of matches. What happens? The fire comes out and it blazes immediately. Isn't it? And then it begins to warm up and the flames and the fire and immediately what will happen all the snakes that have been hiding around immediately they see the fire is burning they begin to run out nobody shouts nobody shoots any gun nobody applies any cutlass you know what i'm telling you that as we're all gathered here and we pour the spirit of god like oil upon you and we light you and you begin to burn on their own the demons will fly out on their own all the scorpions and all the snakes and all the evil spirits and the familiar spirits without any kind of prayer without any kind of shouting without any kind of command everything begins to move out very quickly because they know that the fire is burning and that is what we want at this retreat but if that is going to be the case you know what is going to happen then your camp must be holy your camp must be holy it is in the holiness of the camp not just in the auditorium here you see, it is you know, in the, some of the retreats we have held. I didn't have the privilege that I have now to come and start the retreat because I was always at the, at the Wednesday meeting in town. And uh, I didn't know what the other people did. I believe that they did the best they could. But sometimes when I came in those retreats, I would see some of the you know, young people that they would just be making toilet of all these uh, places just urinating. And I wonder, is this camp holy enough to, for God to manifest himself? And sometimes some of the women, nursing mothers, in the, at the far back, at the end of each of these halls, where we are, while the message is going on, and their baby or their child wants to, you know, make use of the place like a toilet, they just release the baby, and the baby is making the use of, I mean, the hall here, like a toilet, and the whole place at the back will be smelling. And I wonder, will this place be holy enough for God to drive away all these enemies? You know, sometimes the mattresses in the hostels, they put those children there and those children just mess up the whole mattress that in the day the place of worship is smelling in the night the place of sleeping is smelling where is god going to manifest his glory it's going to be different here for the sake of our victory for the sake of overcoming all the enemies for the sake of lighting the fire and putting all the wood together that the flame will begin to burn and there will be nothing, no uncleanness, no pollution, no corruption, no evil word coming out of our mouth. And I'm telling you that the enemies are going to bow in Jesus' name. But let him see, let him see that we really mean to have this come pure and holy. Now let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. 
Already I've read to you and I've explained to you interpreting and applying to our lives from verse 1 all through to verse 2 to verse 3. And now in verse 4. And the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And the house was filled with smoke. I will need to remind you of something we see in these angels. Because it says in verse 2, above it stood the seraphims, in the plural. And it says, one cried to another. One had six wings each. With twain covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then it says, the post of the dog moved at the voice of him that spake or that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Now let us realize as we come together, there's something you see among these angels, and that is unity. There was no contradiction. There was no controversy. There was no argument. They all concentrated on one thing. If we are going to have the needed revelation, we need to manifest that unity. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, there are some people, they cannot live without argument. They cannot live without disagreement. And I want to tell you that argument or disagreement hinders and limits the moving of the power of God in the midst of God's people. It is when we're united together and we walk in the same direction and we say the same thing and there is such a unity that is unbreakable. We're united not, not only physically, not only outwardly, but we're united in heart. We're united in attitude. We support one another. We complement one another. It is in that unity that you'll find that the Lord will move in a mighty way. If you attend a particular seminar, and after you have attended that seminar, uh, you know, another person also attended. And after that, he began to discuss with you and say, well, I don't like the way that brother was speaking. Why didn't they give that seminar to another person? You say, but that is not unity, what you are saying. You are not united with that brother that spoke. You are not united with that sister that gave that seminar. And we need to be united, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And also we lead the Bible study and you say, I don't, you know, the way that a person led the Bible study, look at the way he pronounced this word. This is the way it should be pronounced. Isn't that a spirit of argument and disagreement and a spirit of pride? Wanting to prove that you know more than that individual. If you know that the word has not been pronounced well, but you understand the meaning of what he said, why don't you just say, praise the Lord and be united with the person that led that Bible study. Or we come up here and, you know, somebody preaches the word of God. Always in unity. Always in unity. You know, I've known some people and they hinder the blessings of God in their lives. If they see a particular person come up to preach, they just close their Bible. They don't take any note at all because I, I don't respect that individual. I don't know why they have given him that message to preach. And that is going to hinder the blessings of God in your life. Or sometimes the disagreement or the argument will manifest in the place where we sleep. Just before this meeting, I said all our coordinators should go and call all the people and bring them down here. I hope it was an easy job for them. I hope there was nobody so rebellious and so disagreeing and will say, No, I'm not ready now. Go your way. I came to the tree by myself and I know what I want. And it is not none of your business that I'm here now. I want to sleep now. I'm tired now. I know the way I am. I hope there is not such a disagreement and I hope there is not such a kind of argument if we can be united during this retreat. In unity, there is strength. In unity, there is power. If two of us shall agree together as touching anything, many people don't understand that. They think that we can argue in the hostel, we can 
argue in the kitchen. We can argue at the cafeteria. We can argue everywhere. And all of a sudden, at the time of prayer, we say, well, um, that's over now. Let's agree. In the name of Jesus. Now we're in agreement. No, that is not agreement. But in the day, you are in agreement. In the night, you are in agreement. And there is no confusion. There is no controversy. There is no argument. There is no quarreling. There is no fighting. We are united together. I believe we shall see that at this retreat. You know, if we see that in this retreat, prayer will become very simple. The moment we call like this, God will answer. And while we are yet speaking, God will answer. You know, in one of the retreats we held uh, here, and I gave out the messages, and I wanted to concentrate on the messages I was to preach, and other people to concentrate on the message they were to preach. And here I was sitting down, and you know, this brother that was to give the message, he gave the message. Powerful, powerful message. And, but he, he wasn't preaching like I was preaching. Uh, you know, I, you, you see the way I stand, I just stand here. I move a little now, more than I moved five years ago. Uh, so I, you know, demonstrate with my hands now more than I did 10 years ago. But I mean, this uh, region of Asia is, you know, by the time he finished, it was, it was sweating. Because, you know, he turned this way, turned that way, and, you know, put his hand like that and shouted and everything. Thank God he was a young man. And, uh, you know, he, you know, shouted and did everything. And here I was, I was sitting down. Much when he was doing that, I said, praise God, this man's voice is stronger than mine. And, you know, the uh, gesticulations and, you know, the throwing of the hand this way and that way and that way. If I did it by the time I preached two times, I'd be worn out. But I mean, he was just he had a wonderful time, and you know, the people too that you know, when they saw the young man, you know, jumping and doing this, the people were also so happy. And you know, he said, he told them to say amen, they said amen, said hallelujah, they said hallelujah, they did everything like that. And uh, but you know, when he finished, he told the people to begin to pray. And then he turned to me, he came to me privately. I was sitting down here, the people were closing their eyes and they were praying. He said, Excuse me, sir, you are the one that will uh, help us and uh, pray for the people. We came from our regions, they need this, they need this. I said, uh, You know, you are the one that preach, you know, go and do it. He said, No, sir, we want you to, uh, you know, help us. And I said, That's okay, because if we, if we are not united here, at the back here, then there will be no manifestation of power over there. So I said, okay, and I stood up. But the point is this. If while he was preaching, I condemned him in my heart. And I opposed him in my heart. And I said, why is he jumping like that? Why is he throwing his hand like that? Why is he shouting like that? Is this the way he's preaching in his region? Look at the way he's preaching. When is he going to read all the references that I would have read? If I had that disagreement in my heart, and now he turned over to me to take the meeting and to begin to pray, well, I may pray and speak some words, but they will just be words. Because there is no unity. But thank God, I didn't oppose him when he was jumping. I didn't, you know, contradict him when he was throwing his hands and shouting like that. I just appreciated him that he was a young man and, you know, he had all the energy and he better spend the energy for God rather than spending it on the football field. And because of that agreement, you know, I just came. I didn't know he would call me to pray. And then I said, in Jesus' name, the people kept quiet. And then the things I began to say, I was surprised myself. And the things that happened, I was so surprised. I said, what? And uh, you see, that's because we are united. And I hope we are united here. That in the hostels will be united. A sister comes to you and he says, Sister, stand up now. Let's go to the hall. No argument. Or a sister says, oh, Why did you put your child here? In fact, we don't expect the little children here. Why did you put the child here to spoil this mattress? Oh, I'm very sorry. Unity. 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 And uh, why are you going that way now? They want everybody in the hall now. I'm very pressed. I need to get to the toilet. Okay, do you can come back? Unity. You see, when there is such a unity, the Lord is going to bless us in this camp in Jesus' name. Amen. So then, we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is a preparation that we need to make. And we need, of course, to be obedient. Obedient, and this is all that we're talking about. Obedience is related to our unity. When we say sit down, we sit down. Stand up, we stand up. Go, we go. Come, we come. And there is that unity and that obedience. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 John 
chapter 2, verse 6. He that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Even as he walked. You see, if we're walking like Jesus Christ walked, there'll be no distraction. You see, sometimes as we come here together, it is possible that a brother and a sister may be in courtship. But we don't know. We have many districts here. And so we don't know who is in courtship or who is not in courtship. And so if we begin to see a brother and a sister stand right there, 11 o'clock in the night, 11 30 in the night, and they're still discussing, thinking that this is a good opportunity for us to be able to discuss, we'll not be able to iron all these points all this time, and 12 o'clock, and 12 30 in the night, and 1 o'clock, early morning, they're still discussing. Now, it's, that's not working righteously. We don't mean that you are, dis you are discussing sinful things, but the fact that you are there at such an odd moment, at such an odd time, and the fact that this is workers' retreat to come and empower ourselves and to have the glory of God upon us, it is not for courtship. And for those of you that might just, maybe you have just got married in your district, and here you are, but we don't know that. And there you, therefore, you wear the same kind of clothes. And while you are coming, you hold one another in the hand because you just got married last month. And everybody is wondering what's happening to these people. Where did these people come from? And these people from another denomination that just went, came and they went astray. They, they don't they know what we're doing here. And then you approach them, you say, uh, from where are you? I say, what's your business in that? We have just got married. You don't want us to enjoy our marriage? Not here. Let us walk according to the word of God. Don't become a stumbling block to other people. And it will be unfortunate if, you know, husband and wife, here you are, and it's wonderful to be husband and wife. And then you go to the cafeteria, there you, you know, take Coke, and you have two straws, and then you have one bottle, you are, you know, drawing it, and the wife is drawing it, and the people will look at them and say, who are these people? Have they just got married? What's the matter with them? We need to understand that in a workers' retreat like this, there are things you may be doing at home that we cannot do here. So that the power of God, the glory of God, will not be limited in this place. And I know it will not be limited in Jesus' name. That we will walk righteously. We will walk uprightly. That, uh, you know, if you see your brother that maybe you are in courtship where you say bye-bye, you don't even allow people to know that anything is going on. You want to concentrate on what you are hearing. You want to concentrate on the word of God. And if you do that, the blessing of God is going to be unlimited. In the hostess, you'll be getting the blessing of God. In the kitchen, you'll be getting the blessing of God. Over here, you'll be getting the blessing of God. While we're singing, you'll be getting the blessing of God. And while the choir is singing to you, the blessing of God will just be flowing into your life. If we will cooperate with God, cooperate with God, and we're not going to do anything that will hinder the moving of the Spirit of God. In Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. From verse 25. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. So much the more, as ye see the day approaching. You see, there are times that in the, in the workers' retreat, we look at the attendance, and you find that in the morning, people are there. In the following message, people are there. In the following session, 1,000 people are missing. Maybe some of them are the gate. Maybe some of them in the hostel. Maybe some of them just sightseeing, just looking around. How can the blessing of God be upon us like that? Some here, some there, not united, not attending the meetings. Even if you are tired, I want you to come to the hall here. Yeah, the Lord will give you strength to the world. Even if you are sick, I want you to come to the meeting hall here because it is in the hall of meeting here. While we're all together, where, wherever you are, the power of God will touch you. Your sickness will vanish away. You'll become healed in Jesus' name. If you are sad, if you are sorrowful, whatever your need may be, come to the hall here. That's the reason we came, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. All our needs will be met. It is as we combine together, unite together, worship the Lord, hear the word of God, and we do not miss any part of the meeting. It is in that way the word of God will do good in our lives. And then you walk by faith, not by sight. You see somebody that is sick in the hostel, don't say, 
Ah, why did you come to the retreat when you know you are sick like this? Which is better, retreat or hospital? Where the glory of God is or where the medications are? Where the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, where those things are, or in the hospital. And you, the people say, ah, ah, you know you are sick like this, and you came to walk us a retreat. Why don't you now pack your load and then go? Is it good to leave the presence of God? Oh, if we're sick, it's in the presence of God, we're going to get our healing. If we have any problem, it's in the presence of God, we're going to get everything that we ought to get. And I pray that none of us will act carelessly. So that the blessings of God will not be missing in our lives in Jesus' name. We go back to Isaiah chapter 6. You've seen the revelation. And you've seen the condition in which Isaiah put himself when he had the revelation. Now point two is realization. In verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here Isaiah realized his condition. You know, as we come together, we'll need to realize our condition. It may be that there's something lacking in your salvation experience. But realize it. Don't cover it up. Don't act as if no, everything is okay. Let there be a realization. It may be that as you hear the word of God, you discover that you are backsliding. Realize it. Let there be a realization. It may be that as you hear the word of God, you realize that you are not sanctified. Realize it. It may be that you will discover that your way of talking, your speech at home to your children or in your community has not been of the very best. Let there be a realization. It may be that you're feeling in your own heart. The way you always interpret people's action. Whenever they say something, you interpret it this way. Whenever they do something, you interpret it this way. Whenever they approach you for something, you interpret it this way. Whenever they even smile, you interpret it this way. Always this negative interpretation. Realize it. It may be that, you know, in your relationship and reactions to people, there is this kind of hot temper, and you know it. And as we hear the word of God, you just suddenly realize your kind of temper, your kind of attitude, and your kind of reaction to people that offend you. Realize it. You know, Isaiah came to a realization. It may be you will discover that you are prayerless. That you talk about prayer, but the prayer you pray really cannot kill an ant. Cannot destroy a mosquito. Cannot stop a gentle breeze. Cannot quench the flame of the fire it cannot put up the power of the enemy but it is as you come to a realization that god will be able to do something in your life you see if we come to a retreat like this you hear the first message no realization of anything second message no realization of anything the whole of the first day second day they are passed and no realization of anything third day has begun with all the seminars all the bible studies all the messages no realization of anything and at the last time the last message you hear it there's no realization of anything all you just say is that oh it's wonderful i'm okay i'm spiritual i'm safe sanctified and spirit filled I'm walking with God. I'm consecrated. I'm a giant in the faith. And God knows that everything is okay with me. No realization at all. How are you going to get a blessing from the hand of God? When you don't even realize your shortcoming. You don't realize your need. You don't realize your spiritual problem. You don't realize the imperfection that is there. That needs to be dealt with. He said, then I said woe is me he came to a realization and how we need a realization as we come session after session you bow before the lord you bend before the lord and say lord i realize this lord i realize this lord i realize this in fact i said you know he had been a preacher a prophet and here he said woe is me it's so terrible woe is me he said, because I am even undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Now, that doesn't mean that this man was drinking. He wasn't even drinking at all. Not smoking. 
not telling lies. He was a prophet of God. But he saw the very root of sin and the nature of sin. And he saw how dirty he was in comparison with the great bright holiness of God. And he said, I even dwell among a people, um, in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. He said, the, the time I saw the king, the Lord of hosts, I saw my uncleanness. We need to come to a realization. A realization. How do you stand before the Lord? If you are thinking that you are better than you are, there's no realization. If you are thinking you are good enough the way you are, there's no realization. If you are thinking that they have not exalted me and given me all that I deserve, there's no realization. It's when you know you deserve nothing. You are undone before the Lord. That even to be called a child of God, you say, oh, God is only by your grace. I'm not even worthy to be called a child of God. Or oh, this is only by the grace of God. That's the realization. And during this retreat, we need that kind of realization. And then after that realization, here came the renewal and the revival. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, bringing a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. Now, if this Isa did not wait to pray, did not wait to reflect on the word that he had heard, on the word holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory if the man did not even meditate did not even think did not reflect on what he had heard and if he did not voice out his shortcoming voice out his realization if there was no word of prayer at all how would he have got this thing that came unto him now in luke chapter 18 luke chapter 18 from verse 1 and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. As we come together in this retreat, workers' retreat, how we need to pray. How we need to confess our conditions to God. How we need to confess what we realize. You realize your shortcoming, confess it. You realize your temper, confess it. You realize that your obedience has been partial to the word of God. Confess it. You realize that the Adamic nature has not been uprooted. Confess it. You realize that you are, you are lacking the power of God in your life. Confess it. You realize that the fire of God has not been burning upon your altar. You come to that realization then you make a confession of it. It is that confession in prayer that will help you to have the change or the transfiguration you ought to have in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Reading from verse 28. And it came to pass about eight days after these saints, after these saints, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men. Which were, uh, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his disease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You see, it was while Jesus Christ was praying on that mountain. And as we have set, we have set ourselves apart in this place, you'll come to a lot of realization concerning your spiritual condition. And what do you need to do to take it to the Lord in prayer? And the kind of prayer we need to pray here is the kind of prayer that is just flowing just continuous and just continual you see sometimes when we come to a workers retreat like this there are people that are in a hurry and they're looking at the program not only looking at the program they're looking at the time and they're thinking if we're going to finish all the messages and finish all the bible studies and finish all the seminars and finish all the fellowship sessions and finish all the counseling finish everything we have to cut it short and cut it short and cut it short and cut it short no time for prayer we just want to finish what is written on the program. But you see that is not going to transfigure or transform us. But when you realize that here we have come. And the two major things. You hear the word of God and you pray. Two major things. You hear the word of God then you pray. And you pray and pray and pray and pray. Without ceasing. That after the message you are still praying. And even if you have not, when you have not finished your prayer, somebody comes and says, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and he closes your prayer. After that, you still continue with your praying. And the people are eating. You're still saying, oh God, I realize. Oh God, I realize. Oh God, I realize. This one must be done. This one must be done. This one must be done. That one must be done. And it is in that kind of prayerfulness 
that you will find that many, many things will be done. And of course, the things you are asking for will not be physical, will not be material. You will concentrate on the spiritual blessing. And as you seek for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the other things will be added to you according to the word of God. So then, the angel, the seraph, one of the seraphims, took the coal from the altar of God and touched his leaves. And then look at the declaration in verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Theologians and Bible students will say that this is sanctification experience of Isaiah. It may be that you have not been sanctified. When the fire of God touches your heart, it will sanctify you. But then it may be you have got sanctified and you need the Holy Ghost baptism. That same fire of God can touch you and you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It may be that you have been working for God, but now you are tired, and you are weary, and you are weak. I don't know you are going to continue again. You are so discouraged. The fire of God can touch you, and then everything will come. will, will have a new dimension. There will be a change. And after that renewal and revival, a recommissioning. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of the Lord. Many times in retreats like this, people have heard the voice of the Lord. Calling them perhaps to a pastoral ministry. Calling them perhaps to a missionary work. Calling them perhaps to an evangelistic outreach. Calling them perhaps to a greater kind of ministry in the kingdom of God. But the thing is first of all to have a revelation, then to have a realization, then to confess and declare who you are and what you need, the experience you need, and to have revival and renewal before the recommissioning. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then it was easy for him to make a response. And then said I, Here am I, send me. We have come to this retreat believing that great things are going to happen. And we need to really prepare as we enter into the retreat proper. I've told you there needs to be prayer. There needs to be unity. There needs to be obedience. And of course, linked with that obedience, there must be good example. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in faith, in charity, in conversation, in spirit, in purity as well. There needs to be sobriety and quietness. That there will be no noise. And at, whether in the hostel or here, you will be sober. No jesting. No frivolity. And no unclean words will come out of your mouth. As well, you take care of your appearance. You see, as we come together like this, men and women. It is not good to see women not properly dressed. Not fully dressed. And we want to encourage you that as you come out of the hostel, you should be properly dressed. Not only that, you see that we have to open the windows of your hostel because of ventilation, because of air. And as you are in the hostel there, if you see that the windows are open and people, men, are passing, they're going up and down. It will be good that you are properly dressed. And you men as well, it will be wonderful you. You properly dress yourself. We don't uh, wear just ordinary singlet as men. And then come to the uh, hall of meeting here. Neither do we remove all our buttons. I see if the buttons are not to do their job. And have all the chest open as we are here. And you women, um, I don't know when I'll be able to have session for women alone. A lot of things that I need to talk about. But uh, listen to this. Just this night as we have come. And I've not moved around a lot, only a little. I see some of the women opening their heads already right here. Now what you do on the street is different, you know, what you do here. Apart from that, some of the women I see opening their ear, they even cut their ear as low as mine. And I said, what? Deeper life? They've thrown their Bibles into the toilet. They don't read Bibles anymore. That women now caught their ear, and they're even their workers, and they come to the workers' meeting here. And with that bare head caught like that of a man, they are walking about in this place. I pray God will not be angry at us. You see, the Bible says that if women have long ear, it's a glory unto them. 
and women are not supposed to cut their ear. That is still the word of God. Now, if you have cut your ear, it will not grow immediately now in, you know, 30 minutes uh, after this message. But what you can do is leave it uh, as it is, let it continue to grow. But while we are here, cover it up. Cover it up. Because it's even an abomination to realize that a daughter of God, daughter of Abraham, cuts her ear and is exposing that to everybody because it makes you look like men. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says it ought not to be so. It ought not to be so. You read it yourself later from around verse 4 to verse 10 or to verse 15. And so we need to realize that we should appear in a proper way. And we come to worship God. I've told you already, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And when you hear the word of God, you bow, you bend, you obey the word of God. And let there be faith. Let's walk by faith and not by sight. And I believe the Lord is going to ask you, who shall I send? I know it will go for us. And I'm sure you are going to answer, here I am, Lord, send me. Let's rise up and pray. Are you making this time a special event? A special time before the Lord? Are you making this time a time of visitation by the Lord? Visitation from the Lord. A time when the glory of God will fill our hearts and fill our families and fill the Lord's house and fill the sanctuary of God and fill this whole camp. Let the life call from the altar of God touch your heart and touch your lips and touch your spirit and touch your very being. Let's prepare to receive, prepare to receive from the hand of the Lord. As King Uzziah died, as self been dethroned in your life, self that is trying to usurp the authority of christ have you allowed self to be dealt with are you committing yourself to the point that we are going to make this camp holy no unclean words no unclean action and your nakedness should not be discovered and you are properly dressed you are fully dressed you are well dressed in public and you women you will not talk and talk and talk and talk. There will be no gossip in this camp. There will be no backbiting in this camp. There will be no frivolity in this camp. There will be no jesting in this camp. And you men as well. No gossiping and no backbiting in this camp. No lust in this camp. No immorality in this camp. No evil in this camp. No pollution. No corruption. No dirt. No defilement in this camp so that the lord can move in our midst so that his power can break loose in our midst there will be unity in this camp there will be unity in the midst of the people of god unity with the preaching unity with the word of god unity in the seminar unity in the bible study unity in the altar, unity in the auditorium there will be unity there will be unity there will be love there will be endurance there will be forbearing there will be forgiving of one another You want revelation from the Lord? Let self die. You want revelation from the Lord? Let self die. You want to hear that voice from heaven speaking to your soul? Let self die. You want the holiness of God to be revealed unto you in a mighty way? Let self die. In the year that King Uzziah died. All those wrong thoughts, all those wrong imaginations. All the wrong spirit, all the wrong temper. Trying to control your life. Trying to control your attitude. Trying to correct, trying to control your disposition, your relationship with others. 
let self die and as self dies as self dies as king Uzziah dies there will be a revelation to you a revelation to you a revelation to you a revelation to you have you come to a realization have you come to a realization have you come to a realization that something is lacking in your experience of salvation that holiness is missing in your life have you come to the realization that true sanctification is not there have you come to the realization that your heart is not pleasing unto God have you come to the realization that you are not praying enough have you come to the realization that there are things to be settled in your life which you have not settled are you coming to the realization of pride in your life are you coming to the realization of the lack of the power the anointing the authority of the holy ghost in your life have you come to the realization you have a disagreeing spirit division disunity with the people of god argument controversy in your heart towards the people of god have you come to a realization that you don't respect you don't honor the people of god that you so exalt yourself and you only know yourself you don't know any other person are you coming to a realization then realize it and confess it to the lord realize it and confess it to the lord realize it and confess it to the lord Let the coal from the altar of the Lord touch your lips and touch your heart and touch your spirit and touch your nature and burn off the Adamic nature and burn off the root of sin and burn off everything that is not according to the word according to the will of God. Let there be revival, let there be renewal and then there will be a recommissioning you'll hear the voice of the Lord saying who shall go for us whom shall I send who will go for us then will you be able to answer here I am here I am here I am Lord send me Here I am, Lord. Send me. Do you want revival in your soul? Let these be days of praying. Do you want a revelation from above? Let these be days of praying. Do you want everything that needs correction to be corrected by the power of God in your life? Let these be days of praying. Do you want all those demons and familiar spirits and sicknesses and diseases? Everything to be totally taken away from your life. Let these be days of praying. Do you want the abundance of the Spirit of God? The overflowing of the anointing of the Spirit of God in your life? Let these days we come together be days of praying. You want these days to become days of transformation, transfiguration in your heart, in your life? Then prepare through praying. Prepare through praying. Prepare through praying. Above it all, be united with the people of God. Above it all, be united with the people of God. Above it all, be united with the people of God.
In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our precious Father, we bless your name tonight because you are a good God. We magnify you, Lord, because of a truth that is not like unto thee. We thank you, Lord, because of this wonderful privilege that we can be called children of the living God. That, Lord, you can gather us together to renew us, to strengthen us, to equip us, and to build us up. Lord, it's so wonderful. It's so wonderful to be here. It's so wonderful, Lord. Father, we bless your name in Jesus' name. Father, we have not seen heaven, but we can see a foretaste of what leads and what will unite us with you. Father, we are here to receive more from you. And we thank you because you have given us this privilege. Mean people like us, mortar clay like us, that you can bring us together and reveal yourself unto us. Not only revealing yourself to us, equipping us so that you might use us. Lord, we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Almighty God in heaven, we know that this very weekend, this session that we are going to be here together with you, all that you have purposed in your heart, O oh God, all that you have planned for us, we pray that nothing will hinder us from receiving from you in Jesus' name. Precious Lord, we are here to surrender our lives unto you, to lay our very life on the altar. All that we are, all that we have, all that we will ever be, O oh Lord, our very lives, we surrender all on the altar in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, that self that has been militating against us, that has made it impossible for Christ to be enthroned and for him to reign, I will pray, O oh God, that that self will die tonight in Jesus' name. When Uzziah died, there was a revelation. And we know, O oh God, that when we lay ourselves on the altar, and when that self dies, you, a wonderful God, you will reveal yourself unto us. And that is why we are here tonight, O oh God. And we want to call, we lay all that we are, ourselves, every resistance in us, we lay it down on the altar, that they may all die in Jesus' name. We are already seeing, O oh God, a trace of your revelation. We already seen, O oh Lord God, the things that we lack. We already seen, O oh God, through the mirror of your word, how, O oh Lord, imperfect we are. How we are not able to fit into your very program. But we thank you because you have brought us here to sharpen us, to correct us. That the cold, the life cold from the altar of God, we touch our very heart. We circumcise our heart and we touch our tongue and remove every blemish. Do it, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Father, you're looking up unto us to see that unity, to see that holiness and purity, to see that oneness, to see our comportment, to see how we hallow your name, to see how clean and pure our camp is so that lord your power will come tumbling down 
Oh Lord, we pray that Father, you will help us that all that we have heard concerning cleanness, purity of soul, yieldedness, unity amongst ourselves, love towards one another. Father, we pray that all that we have heard, we will live by them in Jesus' name. Lord, we have no righteousness of our own. We are depending upon you. And like the branches that we are, we can do nothing, O oh Lord God, outside you. And that is why we want to remain in you. That the power of God will flow through us that we might live in Jesus' name. Father, tonight, we want you to help us that every area of our life where something is lacking, you will reveal unto us in Jesus' name. Things, Lord, that are still found in our nature, that are contrary to your way, contrary to your will, attitudes and behaviors, oh God, that are contrary to the lifestyle of a believer, of a worker. Show them to us tonight in Jesus' name. And as you show them to us, help us to turn away from them. Help us to cry unto you. Help us to pray. And to pray as never before in Jesus' name. You will be glad with us. And Lord, you will love us and you will pour your mighty blessings upon us in Jesus' name. Thank you, righteous Father. Oh Lord, we are looking up unto you that even as we go to our hostess, multiply blessings, multiply revelations, multiply visitation, multiply recommissioning, we take place in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. As we speak to one another, as we encourage one another, as we share with one another, oh Lord, we pray that we witness your visitation in Jesus' name. Thank you, blessed Lord. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out of the world. I just thank God for all his provision. I just bless you with God.